It's three o'clock now and time for afternoon theatre. The Appointed Hour by Douglas Clark with John Sampson as Lieutenant Charles Holt. The Appointed Hour. happening now. We're in the middle of nowhere. Oh, excuse me, sir. But we oh, what's all this about? I thought Ditcham was the next stop. Yeah, well, Ditcham it should have been, probably, sir. I was just coming along to tell you, because it's difficult for strangers now we've taken the name boards down. So why is the driver pulled up, then? He nearly had my case done on top of me. Yeah, well, if you listen out, sir, you'll hear. Do you mean we've stopped because of siren sounding? Yeah, well, we're under strict orders to stop the train if there's an air raid in the vicinity, sir. Oh. I reckon the driver and fireman have seen or heard something we haven't. Ah, well, there you are, see. You know, I can see seven of the baskets. The Messerschmitts? Well, oughtn't you to be doing something? Evacuating the train and getting people under cover? Yeah, no, sir, you're the only passenger, thank heavens. But I don't reckon they'll be coming after us. Well, what are they after? Or Ditcham, as far as I can see, sir. And how far away? Oh, quarter of a mile. But I thought Ditcham was only a village. There can't be much there. Only the old malting, sir. What have they got to do with it? Ah, uh, well, of course, you won't have heard, being a stranger. Well, it seems our chaps in France left all the armory's binoculars and compasses behind. And we can't get any more because they all come from Switzerland or wherever it is. Ah. So all the civvies who had glasses and such like, well, they've been asked to hand them in and uh, they've been stored in the old maltings. I see. Well, if we got down onto the track, we uh, might see some... No, sir, don't you get any ideas about going along there because I reckon the old maltings is on fire already and there could be explosions. Among binoculars and compasses? Uh, well, you see, they, they also gathered up all the local shotguns and ammunition. What for? Well, for this local defence lot, Aunt Eden's getting up. Sounds reasonable enough. But how is it that Jerry is over here this morning, spot on target? <laughs> well, Adolf gets to know these things mighty quick, sir. Maybe, but he hasn't got second sight. Somebody has to tell him about them. Then he's been told a mighty lot about what goes on round here just lately. Morning, Ronnie. Oh, uh, hello, sir. Uh, this is Charles Holt, who's come to join us. Oh, didn't know you were expecting reinforcements, sir. Well, I wasn't, but I'm very glad to get Charles. He's a regular. We can do with a bit of stiffening up in the Subaltern's Union. You take over here a CPO. You'll stay with him as signals officer. Am I to take over immediately, sir? Yes, please. Now, don't look so hurt, Raleigh. The appointment is Charles by right. He's senior Subaltern. I want you to put him in the picture about everything. Oh, well, sir, the most important thing at the moment is the defensive position map. Yes, how's it coming on? Oh, Charles, this will interest you. Mm. The biggest map we can get of this area is a 1 over 25 thou. So I'm having Raleigh blow up our battle area to four times that size on an artillery board cover. As you can see, he's getting on with it. A useful idea, sir. Mm. I can see the troop positions and wagon lines. Are you going to show survey data and so on? Everything. Remember, Raleigh, I want every tree, every blade of grass in our position shown on your map. Yes, sir. Good. Well, I'll leave you two to get things sorted out. Charles, come and see me if you run into difficulties. Well, uh, what do you think of our setup? Give me a chance. The old man, then. Bertie Gray. I haven't had enough time to form an opinion of him, but even if I had, it's unlikely that I should wish to discuss my O.C. With me, you mean? With you, or anybody else. Yes, I suppose it is a bit of a come down for a regular to find himself in a TA mob like this. Wonder why they posted you here. I can't help feeling it would be better if you were to try to concentrate more on finishing your map than on prying into my personal affairs. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean... Uh, for instance, I should like to see contours in red, true positions in blue, and survey data in yellow. Uh, you can also put a colour legend in the margin. And after you've finished, the specialists can trace as many copies as we need. I don't need you to tell me how to finish it. I was getting on well enough before you came, even if it wasn't a masterpiece. You're wrong. Who's doing the blasted thing? I know what I've got planned. Maybe. I'm simply telling you the map is a masterpiece. What? Excellent. Oh. Do you think so? I do. Otherwise, I'd have told you to do it again. <sighs> no, don't look mulish. We're going to have things right, you and I. And now, suppose we stop the chatter. 
It's half past ten. Time for coffee in the mess, if you're interested. I'm not interested. I want to look around. Are these two wireless sets, the CPO's forward and rear links? Yes, uh, I keep them set up in readiness, just in case of trouble. Good for you. The BC told me you're the junior officer in the battery, and yet you're doing the senior subaltern's job. Uh, yes, well, I've had a bit more formal training than the others who left. But it's not their fault. They're jolly good officers. With regrettable gaps in their technical knowledge. Well, the ones who gone were fully trained. And what are the ones who are left doing about their own education? They're learning slowly. They're a bit short-tempered. Chumpy. Hmm, well, that could explain Major Gray's air of distraction. I thought you wouldn't discuss him. I don't intend to. I was just wondering why, after promising to take me round the battery, he left me here and took a burden. Now, what are the reactions of the men to this atmosphere? Uh, they're a bit disgruntled. We must see what we can do to improve matters. A little quiet gunnery instruction and a tightening up of battery HQ discipline should help. Ah, still here, Charles. Thanks, sir. Good. Here, yes, send you, Raleigh. We've got to do something and do it quick. The CO has just phoned to say he's arranged an inter-battery training competition for next week. Batteries are to go out in turn for a full day's drill order, during which he will set speed and accuracy tests in working out an air chute and barrage. Oh, just the two things we're most rocky on. That's why they've been chosen. All the batteries are in the same boat, but I think we're worse off than anybody. I was wondering, Charles, if you could... Uh, could do anything to help, sir? Quite. Yes, I think so. In France, we found we had to invent a few shortcuts in most types of chute. If I can have the subalterns for a few sessions, I'm certain we can button the whole thing up. Good. You can have them from 1730 to 1930, each day until the exercise. I'll go late on before I forget. Hmm. That won't do much to improve morale. If what you've told me is true, the subalterns should welcome the chance of some instruction. Well, they would, in the daytime. But they're overworked already. Look at your map. Hmm? What does it represent? A gun position. Right. But not just any old gun position. A vital part of the coastal defences of this country. What about it? Has it been dug? Wired? Sandbagged? Surveyed in? Old hard. We haven't even started it yet. As I thought. Well then, we've got to build the position by day and train by night. I can see a captain coming this way. Who is he? Oh, him. Uh, the battery captain. His name's James Benfit, known as Brocky for obvious reasons. Well, you make it sound as though he's not your favourite officer. Just you wait till you've met him. Ah, the new boy. Uh, hello, Brocky. Uh, this is Charles Holt, Brocky Benfit, the BK. Oh, I'm glad to meet you. <laughs> so I heard you were in France, one of the Dunkirk carriers. That must have been jolly for you. It was a useful experience, sir. Mm, I'll bet. Uh, have much trouble with the fifth column? They had a certain nuisance value. Oh. Get out of it. They help the Germans no end. Now, you regulars just don't like admitting that the enemy had a really efficient organisation teed up behind our lines. If you mean I have no admiration for treachery, you're right. However, since you're here, could we discuss more pressing matters? Uh, you're the troop commander of HQ. Who, me? I'm battery captain of HQ troop commander. I thought the two were synonymous. No, not with us. I'm second in command of the battery. Finish. In that case, who does command HQ troop? We don't run HQ as a troop. It's too full of odds and sods. Eh? You can't treat or train them like a gun troop. They need to be trained to be efficient at their own jobs. All right. You do it. Thank you. I take it I have your full authority to arrange exercises. That's all yours. But don't start playing about with our domestic arrangements, or you'll have me down on you. Down on me? <laughs> you know what I mean. As I heard and understood it, you're proposing to interfere if I try to do my job properly. Now, what I'm trying to say is that we're a TA crowd and you're a regular. Our ideas about things are different. And perhaps we should all try a little harder to cooperate with each other. Yeah, that's right. Hmm, good old British compromise. <laughs> uh, you dealt with him all right. Does that make you happy? It certainly does. No, I don't like him. Well, nobody does very much. Toothy blighter. He's a nasty bit of work. And best forget him. Now, as we've so much to get through, we shall have to plan our personal work. I, personally, like to put in an hour before breakfast. for it, Charles. thought one of them was going to open up on me as I crossed the green. He was so low, I could have beat him with an orange. I should finish dressing, if I were you. Huh? Here comes the BC. Uh, six o'clock in the morning. I have to have an air raid. Nearly tripped over my latest coming across here. 
Well, nice beginning to your first full day with us, Charles. You must have got used to this sort of thing in France. Just look at him, fully dressed, almost as if you were expecting it. I suppose you've even had breakfast. Yes, sir. Oh, I thought so. You look sleek and well-fed. Hmm. I could do with some tea. Why were you up so early, Charles? Did you actually expect a raid? Hmm? Oh, by the way, your tie isn't straight, sir. Oh. Mm. I told you, Roddy, I just think it's wise to be up and about early these days. And don't forget, there was a raid yesterday morning. And Jerry has a habit of repeating himself, so I thought it was on the cards that something might happen this morning. I see. You know, I, I think you Stop came down... Stop lathering, Rolly. Answer the phone. Oh, you've got it, Come on, Post. Thank you, A Troop. Uh, a Troop, ready, sir. Standing by to move if needed. Thank you, Charles. Come on, Post. A B Troop report's ready, sir. Good, but I think it's a false alarm as far as we're concerned. Well, maybe not, sir. They're coming this way again. They've gone out over the cliffs. Funny sort of raid. No bombs, yet they're scuttling. Take it, Jarsman. Oh, none of our planes on, or ack act to drive them off, as far as I could tell. Yeah. Uh, that was the CO, sir. There's a stack of timber on fire at Hudson Railway Halt. He's detailed a troop to deal with it. But now we know why we didn't hear any explosions. They used incendiaries. Ah, but why a place like Hudson Halt in the middle of nowhere? Uh, how far from here? Oh, at six miles. The railway runs due north. Oh, blast. Stay right here. Oh, yes, Colonel. Right. There we are, sir. B troop to Welm Junction. Same thing. Timber fire in Goods Yard. Why is our battery dealing with both fires, sir? Both? Oh, heavens, boy. CO says he's dealing with six already. Rolly, you and Henry Kahn had better stand by with HQ personnel at the MT Yard. Kahn? No, oh, you haven't met him yet. He was away all yesterday. In charge of transport, one of your officers. Oh. Bit of a rough diamond. A cigarette? Oh, oh, thank you, sir. You know, you're taking all this very calmly, Charles. What exactly are you thinking? What everybody else must be thinking and wondering about, sir, and whether this isn't the prelude to something bigger. I think they're starting to uh, soften us up, eh? Well, they would have to do air preparation before an invasion, but I can't see that a firebomb attack on minor railway lines would help them much. Try to isolate a bridgehead, maybe? No more trouble, actually. Gray here. Right. Right. Got it. Your turn, Rolly. Dalton Station, as fast as you can get there. Uh, right, sir. Uh, would you let Henry know I'm coming? I'll do it. Hello? MT? Uh, tell Mr. Khan to be ready to move immediately. And Mr. Spoffer is on his way. Nine oh, stations all within 20 miles. Doesn't make sense. Oh, never fear. Brocky's here. What doesn't make sense, Bertie? Oh, hello, Brocky. Come to find out the form. Ah, oh, well, there's a lot of activity, but nobody let us know a thing in the office area. Sorry, my mistake. We've got 150 men out firefighting. Uh, do you mind if I go off and see the fun? I do, rather. I'm going myself to see how we're coping. You stay here and gather another party in case it's needed. Ah, oh, very good, sir. Uh, Charlie, warn the men we've got left to gather at the MT yard. There'll be about 50 of them. Uh, there'll be 15 at most. Um, I don't think you've been with us long enough to contradict. There are 202 men in this battery. If you were to do as you've been told, the result might surprise you. Of your 202, 150 are already committed. Of the rest, 16 are on leave, 3 sick, 2 in the office, 2 in the telephone exchange, 4 in the cookhouse. Oh. And that leaves 25, of whom the mess steward, the batman and sanitary orderlies account for 11. Mm -hmm. You've got 14 drivers, fitters and queue store staff left. Oh, blast these gators. I never get them right. Uh, Charles is right, Rocky. You better round up as many as you can. Well, I'm on my way now. If the CO rings, tell him where I've gone, will you? Right, sir. Goodbye. Now, oh, Captain Benfit, I'll ring round to alert your party. No, oh, leave them, Miss Staff. I want my breakfast. It would be more in keeping with your job if you were to get the cookhouse to brew up and send tea out to the men who are firefighting. Um, yeah, good idea. Now, why didn't I think of that? Look, I'll have my breakfast while the cookhouse makes the brew, then I'll take it round myself. Against orders? You must be very keen to see the damage. I never could resist a fire. Uh, you stay in my place, and we'll be back in a few hours' time. Hello, Rolly. Is the fire out, or are you just the first of the walking wounded? Both. Give me a chair for Pete's sake. Got to get these boots off. The soles of my feet must be red raw. I've been walking over hot embers all day. Exactly what did you find when you got there? Well, there was a stack of new timber in the siding. Tons of it, all blazing like hell. And a copse just alongside, flaring like a torch. Dry as snuff after this good spell. Was all the timber destroyed? Every stick gone. We simply poured about a million gallons of water on the ashes and left them to steam. Pity. Well, if I were you, I'd go and take a bath. It's uh, half past three, so there's nothing you can do until the training session at half past five. Oh, you don't mean to say that's still on. I do. Uh, but you sound extremely sore about something, and I don't think it's either the prospect of training or your roasted feet. Can I help? 
either tell me what's bothering you or go and snitch the bath. I want to finish reading these intelligence summaries. Well, seeing you're reading these summaries... Yes? Well, something about them. Look, my old man's a timber importer in Bristol. Mm -hmm. and since I left school, I worked with him. His letters are always full of the latest timber, Jane. Well? Well, a week or two ago, he told me the government had ordered timber stocks to be dispersed. Importers were told to make some smaller dump in the empty sidings of country stations. Well, has this plan been carried out? I can't answer for everywhere, but the station master at Daunton told me this morning that the dumping from Ipswich and Lowestoft had just been completed in the last few days. And along came the enemy to drop incendiaries. Ah, very opportune from Jerry's point of view. Is that all you've got to say? Well, these coincidences do happen, are happening all the time in war. And you've gotten on to this particular one because you happen to be interested in timber. Jerry probably sent recce planes over yesterday and picked out the new dumps. I think there's something you've missed. Okay. Shoot. Look, when I was CPO, I received those summaries twice a week. And nobody else bothered to read them because they never contained anything but stale news of past bombing raids and things like that. Uh, but there were one or two things that made me think German intelligence is at work around here. You're not suggesting a spy scare. Where else would Jerry concentrate his spying activities, except on the East Coast, where he's going to invade? Mm, it would certainly seem the logical thing to do. But what's your evidence? Well, a week or two ago, there was an air raid on an ammo dump in Thetford Chase. It happened as soon as the shells had been put into the elephant shelters. I know, because I took a fatigue party up there to help stack it. Oh. Now, even if air photographs had pinpointed the shelters, how did the Germans know when the ammunition had been put in? So that they could time their raid for when it would do most damage? Or was that coincidence, too? Hmm, there was a raid at Ditcham yesterday morning. I wonder then how they'd managed to time it so nicely. Another bit of good timing was their attack on the Polish armoured train, the first time it set out for the coast. What I'd like to know is why you haven't mentioned this before. Oh, your own attitude is the answer to that one, sceptical blighter. I'm trying to be realistic. Do you agree with the conclusions I've drawn? Oh, no, don't just shrug your shoulders. Do you agree or don't you? Ah, you've made up your own mind. Uh, what good will my opinion be to you? I'd like to know what you think. It's important. Who to? To me. For all of us. Well, if you insist, I'll admit you've convinced me of something I've been trying to avoid believing, or at least half convinced me. Oh, wonderful. Marvellous. Well, in that case, we can forget it? Ah, oh, wait a minute. Uh, even if we make fools of ourselves, we've got a duty to do. We must take some action. Well, look, I don't want to be a laughing stock. I think our best bet is to say nothing, keep our eyes open, and try and get a pointer as to who's responsible. Mm. Well, that, to say the least, is going to be difficult. Believe me, I know, we had a belly full of it in France. Oh, in France it was uh, difficult because you were looking for fifth columnists who were all French. They melted into the background. Here it's likely to be an easier problem. A German agent, a foreigner? Agent, perhaps, but not a foreigner. You mean to say that you think it's one of our people? It would have to be. <laughs> well, Jerry has prepared the ground carefully enough in all the other territories he's conquered, simply by enlisting the help of the Nationals. Yeah, well, then don't you see it's more important than ever to keep quiet about it? You said we were trying to improve morale. If we start hairs about an active fifth column, we'll be doing more harm than good. Hmm. There's something in what you say, I suppose. Okay, Rolly. It's your pigeon. So I'll do as you ask. For the time being, at least. Now, uh, go and have a bath. Uh, forget the training for this evening, but be bright and early in the morning to make up for it. Rolly, where's that interfering blighter Holt? Where you ought to be, Henry, on morning parade. Me? On parade? <laughs> what about you? I'm excused this morning to get ready for the BC's conference. Yeah, and I'm excused too, permanently. Well, don't tell me. Tell Charles. Now's your chance. Hey, Charlie, I want to work with you. And I with you, Mr. Khan. You weren't on parade. Look, I've never attended morning parades, and I don't intend to start now, nor my fitters. You're wrong. The fitters were there this morning. They've suddenly changed their habits. Now, you must change yours equally quickly. No, putting up for parades before going to men vehicles is a waste of time. Nevertheless, you are going to do it. Your fitters may be good mechanics. They are, I've seen to that. But now they must become good soldiers. Parades will smart them up and improve their timekeeping. Look, you haven't been here long enough to know what their timekeeping's like. I've been here four days. On the last two of them, I've timed the fitters arriving and leaving. Between them, they lose nearly six hours a day. My parades, which last ten minutes, will waste them a mere 90 minutes a day. A 75% saving, which you as an engineer would agree is significant. You snooping bloody regular. I'm paid to snoop. 
But I'd advise you to save your breath to tell the BC the arrangements you've made for the wagon lines in the new positions. Uh, Bertie's coming across the green now with Brocky in tow. There's one other thing before the BC arrives. Standing orders lay down that everybody without exception will carry gas masks and tin hats at all times. You are lax, Mr. Khan, and so are your men. I don't want to find anybody without them in future. And that applies to you too, Raleigh. You're being a bit forgetful at times. Oh, sorry and all that, Charles. Well, stand by for Bertie. Good morning. Uh, Good morning, sir. Henry, you look liverish. Take some salt or fresh fruit for it. Uh, sounds as if he's got constipation more than a liver. The same thing. Now, it's business. All gather around the map. Uh, except you, Brocky, you're going away, so you needn't stay if you don't want to. Only in a week's hygiene course, Bertie. I shall still want to know about the new position. Yes, of course. Now, Charles, what have you got to tell me? And pass the point, Roddy. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Now, sir, you see the two troop positions are marked in. Yeah. The survey is complete and Raleigh is preparing data cards for each troop. Excellent. I was out there yesterday. The gun pits are coming along well. What about vehicle hides? Yeah, there's a ready-made track to the wood in the hollow, sir. Mm -hmm. It'll make an ideal hide. And I found individual positions for all the vehicles. But there's one snag. No, sir. It lies outside the wide defensive position Holt has planned. Ah, what about it, Charles? Uh, we'll have to accept it, sir. If we were to take in the wood, the area would be too big to defend with the men we've got, and it would take weeks to dig adequate defences. Yeah. On the other hand, there's no alternative hide for the vehicles near enough to the gun pits to be of use in an emergency. It's a compromise we can't avoid. Right. We'll keep things as they are. I've also decided, with your permission, sir, to dig a field command post on the site. Well, why go to all that trouble? This place has been specially set up. Permanent wireless, aerials, telephone exchange, and so on. I thought that if we were close to the guns, we could deal with problems on the spot. Uh, we wouldn't be in danger of being cut off from the troops, which has been my experience recently. And it would also save laying long telephone lines. Mm, jolly good idea. Mm. Dug out. Safer than this old cottage. Yes, I suppose it would be a useful alternative. Go ahead, Charles. Uh, we've started already, sir. All the internal lines are laid. Mm, are they? <laughs> you know, this gives me an idea. Don't you think it would impress the Colonel, Brocky, if you could finish the competition exercise with the trial occupation of the new position? Oh, damn good idea, Bertie. Pity I won't be here for it. Well, it'll be something to sweeten the old man up after we've made the usual porridge of the competition. Yeah, but we're not going to make a porridge of this drill order, are we, Charles? We're going to show the CO a few things that'll open his eyes. So we'll occupy the position at 3 p.m. next Thursday. I'll tell the Colonel what we've decided, and that will leave us exactly a week in which to complete the work. All right, Charles? We'll do our best, sir. If I shan't get my preliminary order for the exercise until Wednesday morning. We'll um, discuss things before then, of course, but I'll definitely want a meeting at that time for teeing up the final details. Include me, Aunt Bertie. Uh, my course lasts till next Friday afternoon, and I'm having 48 hours leave in the smoke. Oh, yes. And when I get back on Sunday night, all the excitement will be over. But I'll be thinking about you. See you next week. Just look at that, Charles. Old Henry taking his first morning parade. Bags of swank, too. Chest out, chin in. By Jove, what a difference. Last Thursday, he was beefing about parades. Today's Wednesday, less than a week later, and he's out there behaving like a guardie. He's a useful hand, our Henry. In mobile warfare, a battery's as good as its fit is allowed to be. And Henry's crowd are good. Oh, you've been doing some more snooping? Take care, young swapper. I warn you, I spend my time snooping. Although I call it observing. It's supposed to be second nature to me. Why to you, particularly? Because I'm on a... Oh. Sir. Good morning, sir. I didn't see you coming. Good morning. Well, on second thoughts, perhaps it isn't. Oh, why, sir? Have you had bad news of some sort, such as the competition being called off, I hope? No, no, the competition's still on. But my beautiful scheme to impress the colonel's a non-starter. I've just been told that because more guns have started to come from the factories, the defence can be thickened up. We're to move in closer to S Battery. Do you mean to say the gun positions we've dug up are useless now? Afraid so, Charles. At least to us. Our new area will be a mile to the south of the old one. But the colonel liked my idea of finishing off the exercise by a trial occupation. So we're going to end the day in the new area even though it isn't prepared. Hell! This would have to happen. Why the devil can't the powers that be make up their blasted uh, minds? Steady, steady, Roddy. Uh, pay no attention to him, sir. After all the work he's done in the last ten days, the thought of doing it all again has caused his snifting valve to stick. I see. One moment, I thought... Uh, what, sir? <sighs> Never mind. Come on, let's get back to the command. Lord, am I pleased that lot's over? Now, where's that murdering slave driver Holt? He should be back. It's after five. You seem to spend half your time coming in here asking where Charles is. Well, keep your hair on, Rolly. I want a word with Charlie, boy. The Hun. What do you mean by that? 
Well, he may be efficient, but by God, he's ruthless. His efficiency soars through the exercise these last two days. That's just what I'm saying. I've never had clearer MT orders, but Holt rushes us too much. Look how he made the gun vehicles leave the last position. I'd got the best part of 50 wagons nose to tail on a track where we couldn't turn round, and just at that moment, a dozen jerry planes appeared out of the blue. Yes, I thought we'd come to a sticky end then, all right. You can say that again. How they miss seeing us, I'll never know. We'd never be as lucky a second time, and that's what I want to see Holt about. He nearly had us killed. What do you think they were after? Under clue. Oh, and about time, too. Hello, Roddy. Henry. Now, you're back early. Are all the vehicles and stores in and maintained? How should we know? Make it your business to find out. After an exercise, you're supposed to attend to guns, equipment, men, self. In that order. Well, get on with it. Charles, I'm certain somebody tried to do the dirty on us. That raid was slap on the gun positions we dug last week, and it took place at exactly three o'clock. If the Colonel hadn't given us orders to go to the new position, we should have been caught in the open with our pants down. I agree. It was timed too exactly to be a coincidence. You think our plan was known to the enemy? I do, sir. And I think there is evidence to support that belief. Yeah. On the day of the timber fires, Roddy Swaffer came to me with what at first appeared to be a quite fantastic story, which I may not have believed. It hadn't been... Well, that's it. More or less, sir. And today's events seem to prove Raleigh's theory. I don't like it one little bit, Charles. But there's the evidence of my own gun pits to convince me. Convince you of what, buddy? Oh, hello, Colonel. Were you looking for me? Just to congratulate you. The umpires and I were impressed by the batteries showing on both days. And with you, Charles, I heard you had a lot to do with introducing those new procedures. I shall want to know more about them myself. I'll write them up for you, sir. Do, please. Well, come on, Bertie, cheer up. You'll be splendidly. Colonel... Holtz and I have a problem we'd like to discuss with you. What now? Before I've had my tea, I have a hard... Now, Colonel, you... please. It's extremely disturbing and important. You sound mighty serious, Bertie. Okay, far away. <clears throat> well, the bombs that were dropped in that raid this afternoon fell under gun pits we would have occupied if there hadn't have been a change of plan at exactly the time scheduled for the occupation. You'll probably find the rest of what we're going to tell you pretty incredible, too. But there have been several incidents lately. More than incredible, Bertie. But I'm impressed. Against my will. What do you make of it otherwise, Colonel? I don't like the thought of a spy scare. Charles, you've been thinking about this for a week. What conclusions have you come to? I think, sir, that somebody within the regiment has given the information away. And by that I mean directly to the enemy and not just by careless talk. That's not the sort of accusation any CO likes to hear leveled at his own regiment. Well, there's no blinking the fact that those gun positions were plastered without there being any movement there to attract attention, sir. And not far away, in full view, was the whole battery. It must mean the raid was on a prearranged target at a prearranged time. Agreed. But I want to know why you think one of my soldiers is responsible. Sir, no civilian could have known so much about the position and realized that timing was so important. Five minutes later, and the guns would have been safely in the pits and the men in trenches. That's why I believe a gunner passed on the information. Well, there's only one course open to me. To report to Div HQ and then to security. Meanwhile, keep your thoughts to yourselves. Nobody not already in the know must get wind of this. Oh, Saturday morning, wacko. Afternoon off and a night in a pub in Ipswich. Uh, you'll have to do a new map, I'm afraid, Rolly. Just like the first one. Oh, I knew it. More fool me for saying it's Saturday. You'll expect me to work through till I've finished, I suppose, and miss my afternoon off. Oh, you can break off in time to come into Ipswich with me for dinner. Oh, thanks. Are you sure you won't want me to foot the bill? No, only for what you eat yourself, but all the drinks. <laughs> I'll supply the car. How's that for a bonny bargain? It stinks. Oh, good morning, sir. Nice morning. Cut the climbing, Roddy. The colonel's on his way over. He wants to see all three of us here. Have there been some new developments, sir? Just got back from London, so he should have some news for London? Us. Not Eastern Command. Command sent him on to London. Now, here he is now. Good morning, sir. Good morning, buddy. I thought I'd better come and tell you lot what the intelligence boys think of your deductions. Are they hopeful? Just the opposite. They placed no credence at all in what I had to tell them. Mm. I was thanked for my trouble and asked to keep my ears and eyes open and to send in another report if I thought there were any further developments. Oh, then the case is closed, sir. Don't sound so pleased, you idle young bounder. The case is definitely not closed. The treatment I received stuck in my gullet. They handled me as if I were an old maid complaining about a man under the bed. The least they could have done was to take me seriously. 
After all, the raid was intended to kill us. So we'll set out to show them we're right. How are we to do that, sir? And before we go any further, I want Holt and Swaffer to collect all the evidence and write up a full report while generally continuing to investigate matters as they have done up to now. All in the greatest secrecy, of course. As soon as I have the report, we'll consider what to do next. We'll start right away, sir. Come on, Bertie. We know how to hold up the work. Goodbye, you two. Goodbye, Goodbye sir. sir. What the hell did you want to start this business for? I told you nobody would believe us. Now, even the most suspicious crowd of the lot, security itself, is laughing at us. Oh. Write up what we know and forget it. We started it. We'll finish it. Tell me how. And the first job is to consider who could be responsible. Oh, that's going to be very easy, that is. Only 800 men in the regiment. That is, if he's in the regiment. Oh, when I said the regiment, I meant the battery. And nobody in the other two batteries knows about our positions. Oh, fine. That leaves just over 200 of us. Oh, uh, what about the staffs at HQ and Div who got copies of the map? I'll count them. Although the staffs didn't know our timings. Say, 300 in all. A lot better than 800. Oh, yes. <laughs> you say it as though you could run through 300 between Revali and breakfast. Stop being so bloody obstructive. To start with, I propose to disregard anybody who isn't an officer. What possible grounds can you have for doing that? The men live too close together to get opportunities to pass information regularly. So they'd never be able to keep their activities quiet. Officers get about more, work on their own, and are also in a position to get more accurate and precise information. <laughs> Accurate and precise are hardly the words to use. Our friend slipped up badly over that raid. He got the first scheme through, but not the change of plan. We can probably profit from his mistake, which I reckon he must have made for one of only two reasons. And what are those? Either he couldn't get the new information through in time, or he was unaware of the change in plan. Uh, how are we to decide which caused him to make a bock of it? From what you've told me about the clever timing of previous attacks, I'd say that X can pass information and have it acted on within 24 hours. That's obvious. So we know X is in the habit of reporting regularly at frequent intervals. Just how can you make that out? Well, he must have prearranged times for sending messages, otherwise there'd be nobody at the other end to listen. And unless those prearranged times are frequent, the news he sends couldn't be acted on so quickly. So, what it boils down to is that we think X did not learn of the change of plan. He must therefore be a local officer who knew the original scheme, but who couldn't, well, presumably through absence, have got to know about the Colonel's order of the day before the exercise. That's it. Now, you make yourself responsible for finding out who was away from the area last Wednesday and Thursday, and report back here to me this afternoon. Well, can't you find out for yourself? What about my map? Fit it in between times. I am going to survey in the new positions. It'll take me till about three o'clock this afternoon. I'll see you here then. Well... Here's your list of absentees. Four of them. The staff captain, eh? And the assistant adjutant both went on leave last Sunday. Within the battery, Cedric Fitzalan is on leave, and Brocky Ben fits away on his hygiene course. So, choose between that little lot. Not so fast, Rolly. Otherwise, I shall start thinking you've an ulterior motive for not wanting us to succeed. What's that supposed to mean? You're trying to torpedo every move by lack of enthusiasm. Why? I've told you till I'm blue in the face. You wouldn't believe my story first, Doc. Why should others believe it any more than you? Even the Colonel was laughed at when he reported it officially. I don't like being laughed at. Well, nobody does. But you saw how the Colonel reacted. He's out to make them laugh on the other side of their faces. Yeah, we're the ones who are doing the work. Let's get on. Oh, I can't choose between your four suspects, so we'll go off on another tack. Communications. The most difficult problem in spying is not gathering information, but passing it on. Now, the most powerful wireless sets readily available are those we are equipped with, but they're built with trench warfare in mind. I know from bitter experience that their cross-country range is only four or five miles. Ah, you're talking about voice procedure. When key is used to send Morse, the range of a number 11 set can be hundreds of miles, given the right conditions. The expert speaks. Now, I'm not very well up on wireless, but you did the Cattery course, so I'll take your word for it. Right. We'll accept he can use a number 11 set. Now, we must look for an able Morse signaller among our suspects. Well, I, I know that Cedric and Brocky are both hopeless at Morse. Tell me how you come to know that. Well, the Colonel's just turned the command net over to Morse, and he pointed out that those officers who didn't know Morse would be at a serious disadvantage. So we were all ordered to learn key work. But if you all learned Morse... No, we didn't. The signal sergeant gave lessons, but uh, apart from me, nobody showed the least knowledge of or aptitude for key. Bertie was so annoyed about it, he ordered officers to keep Morse buzzers on their desks so that they could put in a few minutes' practice whenever they had a moment to spare. Did everybody do this? Well, I know there are buzzers in the troop offices. Well, just training keys, capable of making a noise, not of transmitting. I 
don't know whether Brocky has one in the queue office. Well, we can find that out by asking the queue sergeant. Steady. We can't go asking questions that could give the game away. While Brocky's on his course, it's my job to sign queue indents. I'll get the queue sergeant to bring some along and we can ask him then. Fair enough. Shall I ring him? Well, do that small thing. Now ask him to bring the goods over straight away. Just sign the top copies, sir, and use the carbons for the rest. In triplicate? Nothing so common, sir. Seven copies for stores, whatever the word for that might be. A septuplicate, I suppose. And only one item on a sheet, sir. Different vocab number, different indent. Twenty-one sheets of paper there just to get one button stick, one badge and one holder worth one and tuppence all told and lost by gunner jars on leave. It hardly seems worth it. But here goes. Q, has Captain Benefit got a morse buzzer in your office? No, sir. Thanks, B. Oh, don't tell me he's dodging his morse practice. No such luck, sir. He practices regular on his wireless set. He, he hasn't got a set. Not in his office. He has, sir. Complete ground station, set up and working. He can't have. I know our establishment of sets, and I keep them all here in the signal store, except for the two working in this office. Pardon me, sir, but you haven't looked at a G1099 scale recently, have you? I've never actually seen one. Well, there's a lot of different columns in the scale, and the establishment depends upon what role a regiment has. We're here in a coast defence role, and that entitles each battery to one more set for a static observation post on the cliffs. Oh. Well, why wasn't the set given to me? Because Captain Benfit thought he would hang on to it and use it himself until a static OP was set up. But if he's using a set for practice instead of just a buzzer, he must be sending loads of rubbish out over the air. It's merry hell sometimes, sir. So Captain Benefit's pretty poor at it? Well, sometimes I think he's got the hang of it, and sometimes it's just a jumble. Does he do any knob twiddling to pick up other stations? Sometimes. He says reading's more difficult than sending. There must be quite a din in your office when this is going on. Some chronic at times, sir. But he's pretty considerate on the whole. He usually starts his practice every day at four, when I step out to the mess for a cuppa. Do you mean he always waits until he is alone before he sends? Mostly, sir. But if I'm a bit late setting out, I get the full benefit. But he usually has the goodness to close down by the time I get back. Oh, thanks, Hugh. Here are your indents. It's good to hear there's one Morse enthusiast among the officers. Well, it's a good job they're not all as keen as him. Otherwise, they'd jam every set in a blasted army. And anyway, I'm getting a rest this week. Thanks, sir. This doesn't mean Brock is sending information, just that he's a bit irresponsible to clutter up the air. Even the most irresponsible officer must know he shouldn't jam the wave bands with practice signals. Oh, I suppose so. Lord knows why he does it. Why should his standard of morse differ from time to time? Couldn't that suggest that he's an accomplished signaler trying to give the impression that he's only a beginner? I thought learners came gradually up to standard and didn't jump above. Then it's more than likely that anybody who sends rhythmically one day and fumbles the next is a skilled signaller trying to dissemble. It still doesn't prove Brock is our man. Not that one fact alone. But why should he always open up exactly at four, whether the queue is there or not? If he thoughtfully used the sergeant's tea break to spare him the agony of the noise, why, when the sergeant is late in going, does Brocky's thoughtfulness for others not cause him to hold off for a few more minutes? When put like that, it, it does seem as if Brocky had to meet a deadline that somebody's listening out for him right on four o'clock each day. And his business never takes more than a quarter of an hour, so he shuts down as soon as the queue reappears. Well, we still have no hard proof. No proof, but a prime suspect. Can we do anything to get proof? It would be quite easy to have the two command post signalers take down his message. I've been thinking along those lines myself, but I'm a bit uneasy about it. Well, why? It's a first-class scheme. It's a delicate business. Well, I thought when a set tunes into another, there's an unmistakable oscillation. Particularly when sets are close together. And that might warn Brocky somebody's searching for him. Side tone is not nearly so noticeable if you're receiving Morse. You mean it could be worked without Brocky knowing? I'm sure it could. And don't forget, you happen to be tuned in exactly to pick up Morse. You're the expert. If you think it can be done. A piece of cake. Now, tell me what you were up to last night. And checking up on Brocky's known absences from the area to see if there's any pattern between them and the air raids. Any luck? Lots of facts leading to no useful conclusions. Now, Brocky doesn't take the usual ten days leave every three months. He uses the permitted alternative of seven days every three months plus 48 hours every month. That means he's away four times to everybody else's once. Uh, legitimately. Although I suppose it could be argued that he could get about more by going off more frequently. Or that he was never away from the scene of operations longer than he need be without arousing suspicion. Good point. Apart from leaves, he's been away from the battery only twice. Uh, once on an observation of fire course at Lark Hill and then on this current hygiene course. None of the raids has taken place during his absences except this last one in our position. 
Well, if he is X, he wouldn't want to be present when his own nest was fouled. Uh, well, we mustn't try to make fact-fit theories. I'd be happy to know for sure that we're wrong. But don't forget, for his battery captain, he has endless opportunities for getting about. Far more than anybody else. Look, why not interview Lance Bombardier Green, Rocky's driver? He'll be able to tell you about his swans around the countryside. We'll see him after break. A warm green as you go for coffee. Uh, here at 11. Bombardier Green, I understand Captain Benford is due back this evening. Uh, did he tell you which train he will be coming by and whether you were to meet him? I've got to pick him up at Saxmundon, 2011 hours, sir. You've got it all arranged? Yes, sir. Just putting the finishing touches to the truck now. I've been able to give it an overall and coat of paint while Captain Benford's been away. I saw it on inspection yesterday. It looked very smart, even then. Oh, thank you, sir. But how long is it going to get the chance to stay like that, sir? Well, that depends on you. It's your responsibility. Never get two minutes together when Captain Benford's here. Always wanted to go off somewhere. Not that I mind that. I like driving. But it doesn't give me time to keep the truck in good order. You've always got the satisfaction of doing an important job well. Important, sir? Sometimes I think we go out just for the joyride. What makes you think that? Oh, take that ammo fatigue party a few weeks ago, sir. Q always takes six lorries and a dozen men to collect ammo. We all know that dump. We all too. We damn near built it. But a captain, he got it into his head that an officer ought to be in charge of the party and detailed himself to go. Nearly 50 miles each way. And what happened when we got there? You tell me, Bombardier. An ordnance sergeant showed us where to get the ammo. Captain Benfit said, get it loaded as quick as possible, Q. And then he asked the ordnance waller if he could stroll about a bit while the lorries were being loaded. And off he goes, carrying his map board and swinging his stick like he does, and looking all about him at the trees and shelters. Millions of rounds there are there, sir. <laughs> or were. Oh, yes. I heard they were bombed. Yes, sir. About a couple of days after our visit. Me and Captain Benfit drove past it a few days later, and for nearly a mile, it's black, burnt out, with no trees, no bracken, and no ammo. It must have been some blaze. With all them shells going off, I'll say. Uh, but to get back to the story, sir, uh, when the captain had finished his walk and the uh, lorries had been filled and we'd been waiting ten minutes for him, he comes back and he says, as calm as you like, finished already? Good. You can find your own way home, Q, can't you? So you won't need me anymore. <laughs> so we came on ahead, going quicker than the convoy. We hadn't done a thing except waste petrol and time. And quite a lot of our journeys are like that. Never mind, Bombardier. Do your best to keep the vehicle well maintained. Right, sir. Uh, is that all, sir? Yes. Thank you. Sir. It was bad form allowing him to speak about Brocky like that. Good Lord. Half past eleven. I asked Bertie to come along about now. Did you hear what I said? I heard. And I agree. But we're going to use every means open to us, fair or foul, to get to the bottom of this. I no longer feel much loyalty to Benfit, because Green's story sounds too much of a coincidence for me to stomach. What's Bertie coming for? And to hear how we're getting on. And I particularly want to persuade him to be a witness when we monitor Brocky. Well, Charles, what is it you want to discuss? We're fairly sure we've found our man, sir. Yes, quick work. Are you sure? All the evidence, and we have a good bit of it, points to Brocky Benfit. Rocky? Nonsense. He's not clever enough. Perhaps you'd better hear what we've got to tell you, sir. Yes, I think so. Charles, I'm very disturbed by your suggestion. I shall be very angry if you can't justify your accusation. If you would sit down, sir. Well? It appears that Brocky has a wireless permanently set up in the queue office. Every day at four o'clock messages get across to the continent so quickly. Well, that is the story up to date, sir. And very convincing it is, too, circumstantially. But I still find it hard to think of Brocky as a traitor. However, we must be extremely careful, in case you're right. Uh, he's due back this evening. I suggest you steer clear of him, without making it too obvious, mind. When would you like us to try to monitor him, sir? As soon as possible. This business must be cleared up. I've arranged a trial occupation of the new positions for next Thursday and Friday. I shouldn't like it to be upset again. We'll let you know what arrangement we make, sir. We should be able to fix it by Tuesday. Now, sir, Roddy has run out a direct telephone line from here to a convenient spot near the queue store. He's got the phone and a wireless set in the truck. Mm -hmm. He's driving himself so that nobody else is involved. 
He will phone us as soon as the queue leaves for his team. But why the truck and wireless set? If Rolly is seen with him, he can pretend he's running an exercise. But if he were to sit with just a phone in the middle of nowhere, he would look suspicious. Excellent. What happens if Rocky doesn't send? Are you going to explain it to your signalers? If that happens, I phone Rolly and tell him to switch on his set and send a message. The signalers will take it down and be none the wiser. Yeah, you seem to have guarded against all eventualities. But why wait till today? Because I guessed he might use yesterday to get his set in order and to pick up the threads of his ordinary job. Well, among other things, he went to see the results of the bombing. Any crocodile tears? Only what one would expect from a perfectly innocent man. Uh, are these your signalers arriving? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Best. Uh, Saunders, in, ready for the test? What sort of test is it, sir? Trade test? Uh, you could call it a confirmatory test. You are going to be sent a Morse message on an unknown frequency. Uh, your job is to search the wave bands, pick up the sending station, and take down the message. The message, when it comes, could be gibberish, a uh, sort of code, or straightforward stuff, or a mixture of both. So don't be baffled by it. Take down every single thing exactly as you hear it. Now what happens if there's more than one set sending, sir? Uh, pay attention to Morse only. And as our unknown set is in fact close by, its signals will be so loud and clear that there'll be no mistaking them. Uh, switch on now, please. Hello, Rolly. Okay. Best. Saunders, begin now, please, as quickly yep. as possible. Yep. That's it, sir. He's finished. Could I see both your last sheets, please? Thank you. Ah, here's something. You both put ack at the bottom. Did you, in fact, hear an acknowledgement? I certainly heard it, sir. Just a quick answering blip from a second set, much fainter than the rest. Answering blip? You're sure it wasn't the first set asking for an acknowledgement? Oh, you were trying to fool us, sir. There was a second set much further away, just to send the act. But it came in quite distinctly, and as you can see, it came in after Messy James. Yeah, thank you. Both done extremely well. I didn't believe you could do it, but I was wrong. Uh, as these are test papers, would you sign them, please, before you go? Sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, all the sheets, if you will. I do. Thank you. All right, carry on now. Sir. <coughs> well, that act convinces me. Those two lads were so sure about it. I'm certain the message was received and acknowledged by somebody who was expecting it. Of course, the message itself is harmless. Target 0013, ref target 0012, drop 1600. Just ordinary fire order groups. Ordinary, but in the wrong order, sir. Well, perhaps Brocky doesn't know the right sequence, not being on the guns. Well, he must do. They never vary. And in any case, Brocky did an observation of fire course at Lark Hill. If he hadn't known the correct sequence there, he'd have been cashiered. So you think he meant to send them that way? Yes, I think he had a good reason for sending them as he did. Well, did you get anything? Yes, these. Hmm? What do you make of them? Target. This looks like a disguised message. Otherwise, the orders wouldn't be out of sequence. Mm -hmm. Have you decided what it means? No, not yet, but we'll have a bash at it. Now, <clears throat> ref target 0012. Uh, that must refer to the last raid he ordered, and we all know where that was. Yes. Slap on our gun position. Uh, plot his corrections from there, Rolly, on the artillery board. Uh, which way does drop refer to in this case? It normally means shortened range, so it's entirely dependent with us on which way the guns are pointing. In that case, it sounds like go south to me. South being at the bottom of the map, and drop meaning move towards the bottom. Uh, try that, Rolly. It could explain why the range is given before the line corrections. If drop means go south... More will mean go west, and less will mean go east, and so on. Yeah, understood. Now, the second is dependent on the first, so the first must be something for which there is a recognizable datum, such as cardinal point on a map. Got it, sir. What's the answer? Well, his first target, 0013, is on the new gun position. Ah. 0014 is on the wagon lines, and 0015 on the command post area. I had a nasty suspicion they would be... Yes, but when's it going to happen? He must have indicated a date and time. It would be stupid to bomb empty pits a, a second time. And didn't you tell us you'd arrange for the battery to occupy the position at last light on Thursday, stay overnight and return on Friday? That's the plan. 24 hours in the position. Then I think we have the answer, sir. That bogus final order of three rounds gunfire repeat. Yes. Every gunner knows that in this context, repeat means either fire at the same range a second time mm. or fire the same number of rounds a second time. I see. Now, Brocky must have given it a third meaning. I think repeat means 
Repeat the raid as before. Ah. That is at three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, what then? If we don't go out until Thursday evening, the only day when we shall be in the pits at three in the afternoon is Friday. And Friday is three days from now. Quite. Therefore, his order, three rounds gunfire, must mean three days from now. But like that, it can't mean anything else. Well, this means I shall have to cancel the whole thing immediately. Oh, no, sir. If you cancel the exercise, he will cancel the raid, and then we shan't have our proof. Hmm. I must consult the colonel before I finally decide. I'll ask him if he's free to come over straight away. What I've just heard from you gentlemen has shocked me profoundly. When I said I wanted tangible evidence, I didn't think I should get a documented and factual report such as you have just given me. As I say, I'm shocked. But I must congratulate you on a quick and clever bit of work. If this raid takes place, we shall have the final incontrovertible proof that Benefit is our man. Therefore, we must do nothing to prejudice the gathering of that proof by cancelling your exercise. But it's unthinkable that men should be in the pits at that time. They'd, they'd be slaughtered. I don't intend that they should be, Bertie. But don't announce a change of plan yet. Benefit will certainly find some excuse for being away from the position at the critical moment. I'll give him a better excuse. I'll find a reason for sending him off on Thursday night on some errand that will keep him away for 24 hours. After he's gone, I shall change your orders and tell you to do a night withdrawal from your pits. How's that? Very clever, Colonel. Then, to please Charles, who is convinced the Hun won't bomb empty pits a second time, and to exercise the men in the art of selling the dummy, you can leave a few men behind to build mock-up guns and leave them half camouflaged in the pits. I'll inspect the position at noon and stay with you to see what happens. And if this raid actually takes place, what then? I shall slap Benfit under arrest. Do you intend to warn the RAF, sir? Not on your life. They would want to lie in wait and head the enemy off. Then we shouldn't get our proof. Besides, how can I explain that I know a raid is going to take place? It's not as if the enemy planes will be endangering anybody. They'll just hop over the cliffs and be over the position in a matter of seconds. My conference to tie up final arrangements will be held here on Thursday morning. Shall I ask Ben Fit to attend it? Certainly. As battery captain, he will expect to be present. Act normally, whatever happens. Now, that's our program up to midday on Friday. Now, Brocky, I'd like you to visit each troop in turn and instruct them how to dig field latrines. Well, I know I should give some instruction after the hygiene course, but uh, not on Friday afternoon, Bertie, if you don't mind. Why not, Brocky? Well, Friday's payday, so I'll have to visit the bank in Saxe Monden before three o'clock. Wouldn't the morning do for that? Oh, I'm sorry, Bertie, but I've also got to go to the return stores depot and... Well, they only accept repairs and salvage on Friday afternoons, you know that. It's a stupid arrangement, but it's in force, and there's nothing I can do about it. Oh, very well, I'll uh, alter the program. I'll let you know what lectures will take place instead of Brockies when we meet this evening at 7 o'clock in the field command post. Marvellous place, this for a hole in the ground. Tortoise stole, Tilly Labs, and a case of booze. <laughs> what did I tell you, Rolly? Mm. I took out far better than that old cottage. Glad you like it, Brocky. Very here. Yes, what I like best are the niches in the walls. No, quiet, everybody, please. Yes, Colonel, you were saying. Who? Brocky? Yeah, yes, of course, I'll put him on. Brocky is the Colonel. He's got a job for him. Oh, thanks. Uh, Benford here, Colonel. Right, sir. Yes, uh, I, I see, sir. Uh, yes, of course, sir. Uh, right, good night. Bertie, I've got to go to Mill Hill Ordnance Workshops to draw up a program for pneumatizing the guns. Oh. Well, the meeting's at nine tomorrow morning, so, uh, well, I'll have to take a truck to Ipswich and catch a London train tonight. It's, um, well, it's just after seven now, so if I hurry, I'll catch the 8.20. Short notice, Brocky. When will you be back? Oh, about six tomorrow night. Well, I'll be holding the wash-up in this exercise by then in the village command post. Come straight there, will you? I'll be there. So long, lads. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Are the guards mounted, Charles? About five minutes ago, sir, at nine o'clock. The troop majors are doing rounds now. Good. I shall want the orderly officer to go round between one and two in the morning. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Saunders, what is it? Exercise immediate message from the CO. Message reads, <coughs> battery will retire from present position at 22.30 hours tonight and take up new positions in area gravel pit 324797 by 0430 hours tomorrow Friday. Present position to be left intact for reoccupation and camouflage with dummy pieces in pits. Message ends. Oh, 
Hell, did you hear that, Charles? We've got to move. The colonel obviously wants us to practice a night withdrawal, sir. Without warning. Fancy springing that on us. I'll send Rolly on ahead with the recce parties. He might just be in time to set up a director before he gets completely dark. Off you go, Rolly. I'll do my best. Solis, yep. Send to both troops. Prepare to move. And tell all officers to be here in five minutes for orders. Yes, sir. What's the time, Charles? Less than a minute ago, sir. Where are my binoculars? Yes. There's the position. I must say, Bertie, I was impressed by the dummy guns and the figures made out of sandbags. That was Charles's idea. He a town like a true artist. I was only trying to match your display of outraged innocence last night, sir. Yes. You've all done well to hide your feelings over this business. Uh, they should be due now, if they're coming. They're coming, all right. Bang on time. Typical Jerry. Just... Pretty thorough, sir, aren't they? The only thing that stopped me grinding my teeth away completely is the thought that we've got the blighter responsible. I must go and report this, Bertie, when I shall be back in your village command post before six o'clock. Very well, sir. Bertie, you know the deputy assistant proper Marshal Bob Newman, don't you? Yes, sir. The uh, general sent him along. He thought he ought to be responsible for the arrest and custody himself. Thank heavens for that. We really haven't the facilities for keeping an officer under close arrest. We'll look after him, sir. Where do we pick him up? He's coming here. Due any time now. Bertie, it's going to be a rotten job, so I'll make the formal arrest. That all right with you, Captain Newman? Of course, sir. Thank you, Colonel. I just hate to do it myself. I'll simply warn him what he's charged with, then Newman can take him. No explanations. We'll keep it as short as possible. He's arrived, sir. I'm just coming in. Guard the door, Newman, just in case it's necessary. Yes, sir. Ah, evening, Bertie. Oh, you here too, Colonel. Good. I can give you my report while you're here. Oh, hello. Newman, isn't it? <laughs> Quite a reception committee. Did Bertie rope you in to lecture the troops this afternoon in my absence? I was waiting for you. For me? <laughs> what have I done? More than 30 in a WD vehicle. The DAPM is here to escort you, Captain <laughs> Benfit. Is he really, sir? Captain Benfit, I am placing you under close arrest. Well, you, you sound serious, sir. Well, a joke's a joke. I am serious. I would advise you to stop talking and listen. I'm oh, sorry, sir. What have I done? Captain James Benfit, I am placing you under close arrest and charging you with high treason, levying war against His Majesty, adhering to His Majesty's enemies, breach of faith, breach of attestation, and disloyalty to His Majesty. Further charges may be preferred against you in due course. But, sir, uh, but Bertie, you can tell the Colonel he's made a mistake, that it isn't true. Well, I don't even know what he's talking about. Well, tell him, Bertie, for God's sake. I see. You do believe whatever it is they've got against me. Well, you then, Holt. I know you don't like me very much, but you're, you're clever. You'll see through all this. See, I'm innocent. I promise I'll do everything I can to help you. But I'm afraid... You're afraid? Afraid of what? That I shall be unsuccessful. So? It's all cut and dried, then. You reckon you've got evidence against me? We can't go into it now. I would advise you to go willingly with Captain Newman. You will be remanded for court-martial and given all the help you need in preparing your defence. Well, just like that. There's nothing I can say in my own defence here and now. No, I suppose not. Seeing I've not even been told what I'm supposed to have done. But I, treason. Why, that's... It's a hanging wrap. Oh, God, you can't take him out. Come along, Captain Benfit. I haven't got much choice, sir. Have I? Well, now, Mr. Miller, there are lots of things I'd like to ask you, but because of the general air of secrecy surrounding our presence here, and as I've already waited two months to learn what's been discovered officially about Benford's case, I thought it better to wait until the mess servants were finally out of the room before starting the questions. Very wise, Colonel. Mm -hmm. They've been given a completely bogus reason for our being here. I don't understand quite how you fit into the picture. Well, Colonel, I am... How shall I put it? The conducting officer. Mm -hmm. Like all of you, I shall be a witness in court tomorrow. 
But for tonight, I've been instructed to look after you gentlemen. We borrowed this mess from... Well, shall we just say it's been put at our disposal for the occasion? I see. Are you really a civilian? I shall be appearing in court tomorrow as Major Miller. Which is correct. The rank or the name? <laughs> to be truthful, neither. I take it you're from intelligence? Obviously. Mm -hmm. Have you had much to do with preparing the prosecution's case? Although the material you and your officers provided was excellent, Major Gray, uh, there were still some stones unturned. Hmm. Are you at liberty to discuss them, sir? I don't see why not, Mr. Holt. I've already read the summary of your evidence, so I don't see why I shouldn't give you the gist of mine. I realize a trial like this must be held in camera, but the precautions taken to hide our movements and to disguise the fact a trial is taking place at all seem to me to be wrong. We're um, not tampering with justice, Mr. Holt. Let me explain why great precaution is necessary. Ben Fitt is an Englishman and an army officer. If the news of his activities were to become common knowledge, it might result in widespread panic. Mistrust would be everywhere. This must not be allowed to happen. I see. You said, sir, uh, we had left a few stones unturned. Presumably you turned them? Yes, Mr. Swaffer, for the most part. And what did you find underneath? The main task of the prosecution will be to prove that Ben Fitt is in the pay of the enemy. This is not absolutely vital, but we in this country tend to regard altruistic motives with the amused kindliness usually reserved for cranks. <coughs> now, we must try to show that the accused has been betraying his country for profit. And can you do that, sir? Benford visited Germany in 1936. At that time, he was employed in a ship's chandler's firm and was reputedly disgruntled at his pay and prospects. Now, I think he saw in the Nazi system opportunities for men such as himself, or such as he felt himself to be able but unrecognized. That's what I think. He visited Germany again in 1937. Mm. This time, he came back with enough cash to enable him to make a down payment on a Chandler's business of his own. I see. And where did the money come from? Well, his explanation is that on his first visit, he met a Chandler in Hamburg who was strongly anti-Nazi and was trying to buy sterling from anybody who had any. The Nazis wouldn't allow anybody to leave the country with currency. Benford says his friend's plan had been to wait until he had enough sterling to keep him going for some time and then to stow away on some ship coming to England. But when he met Benford, he changed his plans. Benford says he was asked to bring the money to England to start a business on the Germans' behalf. And that when the fellow turned up, they'd become partners. Well, that sounds feasible. Eminently so, except for one fact. The war didn't start until two years later, and yet the German didn't turn up. <laughs> Lots of things could have prevented him from coming. Of course. But our information is that he was still a free man up to the outbreak of war. Well, even that doesn't mean the story isn't true. <laughs> even though Benford's books show that he hadn't made any provision for paying back the loan or interest on it, and do you think that a German would have let him wander off with the money without making any proper safeguards? Did all the profit go into Benefit's pocket? Every penny. And he was successful. We believe that German and Italian ships were his contacts. They were certainly his customers. We believe, in short, that the German government financed him for the sole purpose of spying. But even if the money did come from the German government, it was a once-for-all payment two years before the war. How can you say he's continued to receive payments since the outbreak? Because he is still receiving the continuing profits earned by German capital. So, the court will have to decide between his story and the interpretation you put upon it. In my opinion, it will be the main question. I think Benefit's life will depend upon how it is resolved. Yeah, and what are his chances of being found not guilty? Were I a betting man, Major Gray, I wouldn't touch him at any odds. So you expect him to hang? I do, Mr. Swaffer. This case is so open and shut that except for some unlikely technical error in the conduct of the trial, it won't be possible to afford the finding. You sound delighted. I am strongly opposed to capital punishment, except in cases of treachery. How long will the trial last? You'll hear the sentence tomorrow. But I shall come up myself to let you know whether it is confirmed or not in about three days' time. I'd appreciate that. And now, if you'd excuse me... Of course. See you tomorrow. The prosecuting officer has brought a formidable array of witnesses against Captain Benford. 
He's built up a case which superficially may seem to have some merit, but one which my client claims is founded entirely on circumstantial evidence. The defense is faced with the enormous task of proving a negative, always a difficult thing to achieve, and particularly so in this case because it has proved impossible to bring an equal array of defense witnesses to testify as to what did not happen. Consequently, there will be only one witness for the defense, Captain Benfit himself, who wishes to give evidence on oath. Does the defense appreciate that if the accused elects to give evidence, the prosecution will be given the opportunity to cross-examine him and will also be granted the privilege of making the final address to the court? Captain Benfit is fully prepared to answer any question the prosecution may wish to put to him and is aware that by speaking in his own defense, he forfeits any advantage there may be in having the final say. Administer the oath, please, Colonel Field. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Captain Benfit, why did you practice morse each day in your office? Well, for two reasons. First, all officers have been ordered to practice more since spare moments. And second, I wanted to become more efficient at it. Out of desire to play your full part in a really battle-worthy unit. That's right. We were really only a training unit being used as a front-line battery and... Well, so as far as possible, I, I wanted to help the signal side to become really efficient. It has been said that you practiced Morse at a given time each day, at four o'clock, as though this were a pre-arranged time for you to get in touch with a set listening out for you at that time. Can you give the court an explanation for this? I can. Well, the other ranks had a naffy break of a quarter of an hour at four o'clock each day for a cup of tea. So I meant I had the office to myself at that time, and I could practice Morse for a quarter of an hour without upsetting my quartermaster sergeant. You chose that particular time out of consideration for the quartermaster sergeant? Oh, he chose it. I didn't. Uh, one moment, please, Captain Benfit. Are you asking the court to understand that a quartermaster told a captain when he could and could not train on a Morse key? Yeah, more or less, sir. Now, what I mean is, if I started to practice at any other time, he objected to the noise. And your authority was not such as to override his objections? Well, I tried to be fair about it, sir. We worked closely together. Hmm, thank you. Carry on, please. I would ask the court to appreciate the importance of Captain Benfit's claim that the routine time of sending was not fixed by him, but agreed mutually by him and the quartermaster sergeant out of consideration for the latter and not in order to meet a deadline pre-arranged with anybody, either friendly or enemy, outside the battery. I've noted the claim. Please continue. Now, Captain Benfit, the prosecution has claimed that you made a journey to the ammunition dump in Thetford Chase for the sole purpose of informing the enemy of the lie of the land. Why did you, in fact, go to Thetford Chase? Well, as battery captain, I was responsible for the care and maintenance of all explosives. And this included the correct storage of ammunition. We were building defensive positions and they were going to dump enough shells on site to last for several days of intensive firing. But I wanted that ammunition to be kept in tip-top order. So I, I thought it would be a good idea to go to the command dump to see how the experts store the rounds in bulk. So the journey was a trip to gain practical information. That's right. I saw exactly how it was done. Thank you. You remember that the prosecution has laid great emphasis on the fact that there have been a great many enemy raids on war material dumps like uh, wood yards and the maltings at Ditchum where optical instruments were stored. But paradoxically, they produced no direct evidence that you were ever implicated in supplying information to the enemy about these targets, but by mentioning them have suggested this. To clear the air, it would be as well if we were to establish what you knew about these targets. Absolutely nothing. I didn't know there was a Maltings at Dedsham. I've never been to the station there because I always came and went from Saxe London. Did you know about the timber dispersal? No, I, I should think that was a government secret. And the policy may have been, although it would appear from some of the evidence that it was not as confidential as might be supposed. But did you ever see the stockpiles of wood at the various stations where it was later bombed? No. Or if I did, I didn't pay any attention to it. I mean, heaps of timber aren't very unusual, are they? I agree, they are commonplace. Now, I would like to move on to another point the prosecution has labored. I refer to the fact that the battery gun positions were twice precision bombed. On both occasions, you were absent from the battery lines. What have you to say to that? Well, nothing I can say. 
except that I was lined up to go on the hygiene course long before the first battery drill order was laid on, so my absence on that occasion wasn't of my making. But um, the second time, I was sent by the CO to Mill Hill at short notice, so I wasn't responsible for my absence on that time either. As for asking the German Luftwaffe to make the strikes, well, the idea is ridiculous. I just didn't do it. By that last statement, are you in fact telling the court that you were never at any time in radio contact with the Germans or any other enemy of this country? That's exactly what I'm saying. Captain Benfit, three officers and two signalers of your own battery have stated that they all heard you send a message out over the air and that a few days later the raid they had been led to anticipate because of this message actually took place. I can't explain it. Do you think that these officers and signalers were all mistaken, even when they say there was an answering blip of acknowledgement for your supposed message? Well, there's no think about it. They were mistaken. Will you please tell the court why? Because I didn't do any sending on that day. The batteries were flat. Thank you, Captain Benfit. Now, I'm going to ask you just once more. Have you ever communicated with the enemy? No. That is all I want to ask you at the moment. I expect the prosecuting officer will have some questions for you. <laughs> Captain Benford, I can order a short adjournment if you'd like one for any reason. Yeah, I'm all right, thank you, sir. As you wish. Will the prosecution now proceed, please? Captain Benford, our duty here today is to get to the truth of these matters. I wish to earlier would. There's been a lot of bloody lying going on. Captain Benford. Whilst the court appreciates the difficulty of your situation and is willing to make full allowance for it, I must warn you that we will not tolerate behaviour such as this. Well, that's rich, that is, sir. I mean, what, what more can you do to me than hang me for something I haven't done? Captain Benfit, you've just addressed a question to this court for which I cannot find an answer. But what I suggest, and I do it in all sincerity, is that you should devote all your wit and energy to your own defence. Don't forget that the impression you create in the minds of the members here is important. Maybe this should not be so, ideally, but the fact remains that your demeanour could help you or imperil you. I therefore ask you to help yourself in every way possible. Will the prosecution now proceed, please? Captain Benford, your defending officer has asked you a number of questions to which you have given answers, and I would like to examine those answers. Can we start with your Morse practice? What about it? You stated you were conscientiously practicing Morse in a praiseworthy endeavor to increase your own personal efficiency and at the same time increase the corporate efficiency of the battery. Yes. And you trained on a wireless set. Yes. Why? Well, it was available and more, well, more lifelike than a buzzer. Lifelike? You mean it would transmit where a buzzer would not? No, I'm... I meant the whole feel of it was more like the real thing. This country is desperately short of wireless sets. It cannot produce enough to meet demand. Yet you could have one in your office solely for the purpose of practicing Morse for 15 minutes a day. Well, the set was part of our entitlement. For what purpose? For communication. I was referring to specific purposes. Is it not true that the set you used was intended for a static observation post on the cliffs? Yes. Yet Major Gray has said he was unaware that he had this extra set. I put it to you, Captain Benfit, that you deliberately withheld information about this set from your battery commander so that you could always have a set at your disposal for passing messages to the enemy. No, that wasn't the reason at all. All right, if you must know. I didn't want us to establish an OP on the cliff because it would have... Well, it would have had to be manned by me. I was the only captain available and... I didn't want to be stuck out on some blasted cliff all day and every day. I see. And you were the officer who a moment ago was asking the court to believe that you were a keen, conscientious soldier. So I was. Being out in an OP all day would have meant neglecting my real job. I feel sure the court will be pleased to hear of this example of unselfish initiative on your part. Well, I'm, I'm, Are we to suppose also that you ran the Q side of the unit's affairs efficiently with yourself in complete day-to-day -day control? You described things exactly. And yet your quartermaster sergeant was in a position to tell you when you could or could not transmit Morse. Practice Morse? I've already explained that the Q and I worked closely together. With his say in affairs, 
equating to your own? No, I was in complete command. In that case, would it not be fair to say that you suggested four o'clock as your practice time and that the Q agreed, as you knew he would because of his routine absence from the office at that time? Maybe. I, I didn't want to put his back up. So the time was fixed by you, even though you would like the court to believe it was a mutual arrangement. Well, it could be twisted to mean that, I suppose. Twisted? Come now, Captain Benfit. Either you were the more dominant character or you were not. Which was it? Well, can't you understand a, a civvy soldier like me being messy with a chap, even if he was a quarter? Master Sergeant? I'm not a regular, you know, with all that high bomb bam and mixing with other ranks. That's very obvious. Major Holland, another remark such as that, and you'll be in serious trouble. This case will be conducted in a proper manner. I apologize profoundly to Captain Benfit for that remark, sir. Carry on. Let us now consider your trip to the command ammunition dump at Fetford. You say you went there to see how ammunition is stacked. Did you ask for practical instruction at the time of your visit? I just wandered around to see how it was done. Would you please examine this official pamphlet? It is yours, or at least I presume it is. It's taken from your desk and has your name on it. Yes, it's mine, all right. Would you please read the title to the court? The Care and Preservation of Ammunition. Will you please now turn to page 17 and read the heading? Stockpiling of ammunition in the open and under temporary shelter. What did you learn from a casual stroll round the Thetford dump that this pamphlet does not tell you in great detail? Not much. Except that you can learn more by having a quick look than you can from reading a pamphlet. I see. I should like to jump ahead now to the statement you made about the day a radio message was monitored under the guidance of Major Gray. Well, I told you I wasn't practicing on that day. Not practicing? You were then transmitting in real earnest. I wasn't sending at all. Ah, yes, I remember. Your batteries were flat. That's right. Not a very original and convincing excuse for a radio not to work. Of course not. It happens all the time. Unfortunately, you have no proof of this. Why not get new batteries? But what would have been the use? I'd only got a quarter of an hour in which to send, and that would have been up before the new batteries got there. So you were obliged to open up exactly on four o'clock. By whom? Your contact across the channel? How many more times? I, I had no contact across the and channel. And you still claim you didn't send a message on that Tuesday? I tell you, I had no output on the set. Somebody sent a message. If you didn't, who did? I haven't any idea. Thank you, Captain Bentley. Lovely morning, Charles. Beautiful sunrise. Now, there's no need to pretend, Bertie. You haven't slept a wink, and your mind is not on the sunrise, is it? No, it's not. Three hours from now. Brocky won't have slept either, Charles. He'll have been awake. Frightened. Lord, how I wish he'd put up a more convincing show at his court-martial. Now, you and the Colonel keep on saying that, but I thought he told the truth. But it was so patently unprepared that it couldn't have been anything but the truth. Court didn't agree with you. Otherwise, he wouldn't now be waiting for eight o'clock. The hangman. Charles, this is all damnable. Look, look at the effect it's having on young Raleigh. He's hardly spoken a word for the last three weeks. And how do you think I feel? I helped to start it all, and I have a very strong feeling that, that there's something we've overlooked. Or something Brocky has said at the trial. Quiet, Charles. Signal Sergeant. Morning, Sergeant Sharp. Looking for me? No, sir. Just checking batteries for recharging. I see from the book that the command post needs new ones. Book? What book? Well, the battery charging book, sir. Uh, may I see it? Hmm, help yourself, sir. You know, I hope nothing's up. Uh, wait a minute, Sergeant, please. Um, Tuesday, the 20th of July. Uh, Sergeant Sharp, I see you delivered new batteries for the Q office set on Wednesday, the 21st. Well, for Captain Benfit, sir. Well, just before he was taken ill. Uh, do you remember he'd been on the course the week before? Yeah, I remember, sir. His batteries was dead flat. I was all set to change them. Saturday's the day for it, you see. But I remember Mr. Swaffer telling me that you and Major Gray and himself was going to carry out an important wireless exercise on Monday or Tuesday and had want a good supply of fully charged batteries. So I didn't change Captain Benfit's till the Wednesday morning. Uh, Captain Benfit wasn't there at the time. No, sir. He didn't sign, as you can see, but, well, I knew I could trust the BK. What's the time now, Charles? Uh, nearly a quarter past, sir. The dummy barrage... You'll hell with the barrage. Raleigh can manage without us. Sergeant Sharp, tell Mr. Swaffer to carry on with the barrage. Mr. Holt and I have been called away. I don't think we're going to stop.
stop the execution with that flimsy bit of evidence. Why not? Somebody sent those bloody messages. That's Blim. Brocky did. Hey, mind that aerial, Charles. Oh, that hell erected a 32-foot aerial so close to a corner. If it's Henry's doing, I'll tell you... Got what... it, Bertie. Got it. Got what, for heaven's sake? The aerial. Don't you see? To send as far as the continent, Brocky would have to have a big aerial. It takes at least three men to get one of those masks up, and I never saw one outside the queue office. Neither did I. I passed them a dozen times a day. Why, why didn't somebody think of that? Because there was no signals expert involved in the investigation. Oh, it's Raleigh. Ah, yes, Raleigh. Of course, Brocky could have had a wire aerial strung along the rafters of the queue store. But he didn't. I combed their place in person after Brocky went. There's only one long wire aerial in the village. That's the permanent one on the command post chimney stack. The only chap who could have used that was Rolly Swaffer. That young man has got some explaining to do. How long have we got, Charles? Less than two and a quarter hours. I wonder how long executions take to cancel. Bertie, you said you'd wish that Brocky had made a better impression at the trial. Mm. Was your opinion based chiefly on the fact that he didn't want to man a clifftop observation post five days a week? Partly. Yes, I thought so, and that's the point. Oh, no wonder we missed it. Even Brocky missed it himself. But what point? That a man wanting to send wireless messages to the continent, if you gave him a choice of sights, would choose a clifftop as the ideal place to set up his station. He would have a clear directional send right out over the sea with no interference. Yes. A clifftop OP would be the ideal location for a spy set. Yet Brocky never took the opportunity of using it. Well, don't you think that clinches his innocence? How on earth did we miss it? You know, office. No, I heard it ring. Thanks, buddy. Hello? Who? You're no good. I want somebody with much more authority. Here, just a moment. Are you Thompson? The one at the trial three weeks ago? You are? Well, thank heavens for that. Now listen, please, because there's not much time. Something has just come to light here which makes it imperative that this morning's affair is stopped. There are several bits of new evidence. Charles, Thank God you thought of that point about the cliff observation post. Thompson wouldn't have been convinced if we hadn't dredged that bit up. But with that, he could get a stay of execution on the grounds that the defense had been hampered by security reasons, meaning that it hadn't discovered Sharp's book. So is that it? Let's hope so. But Thompson can't act off his own bat. He's got to locate and convince somebody who can, and it may have to be the war minister. He doesn't even know where Brocky is. He's been carted off to some quiet place because an execution in an ordinary jail will get talked about, no matter what precautions are taken. Oh, pray God, we're not going to fail now, at this late stage. There are 25 minutes left. Oh, it could only have been Raleigh who sent the message we monitored. He was out and about on his own with a set, and nobody else knew what we were doing. We pulled a boner over bombing your pits, though, Bertie. I think the second time he let the Germans bomb an unoccupied position deliberately uh, to implicate Brocky. Clever little blighter. What I don't understand, though, Charles, is why he ever brought the matter up in the first place. If he'd kept quiet, it's likely nobody would have suspected anything. I think he had two reasons, Colonel. First, he felt a compulsion to tell somebody. He was doing an extremely dangerous job well, and nobody knew about it. He wanted to get a reaction. Very possibly right. But you said there were two reasons. Yes, I believe the second was my unexpected appearance in the battery. If you remember, Colonel, the normal run of conversation tended to suggest that my arrival had not been announced because I was engaged in some form of investigation. I remember telling Raleigh that I was a trained observer. I meant of gunfire, of course. But to a man on his guard, it could have sounded sinister. So what it amounts to is that Swaffer reacted to Charles's arrival by making the first suggestion about a spy in the area, presumably to forestall any suspicion you might have had about him. That's it, sir. But I'd been used to fifth columnists and wasn't going to start running around in small circles at Raleigh's ends. I think he didn't appreciate this. My attitude reinforced his belief that I was some sort of investigator. But by the time he'd found that I was nothing more than an ordinary replacement officer, he realized he'd gone too far. He then started trying to dissuade me from taking any action. Yes, I remember. Said he didn't want to be made to look a fool. After that, when he realized he'd no chance of stopping what he'd started, he set out to implicate somebody other than himself. He picked on Brocky. And I swallowed the bait. We all swallowed it, Charles. Conway? Ah, Thompson. Yes? Thank heaven for that. Yes, I'll expect you and Miller later today. Goodbye. And thank you. Stay of execution granted with 15 minutes to spare, buddy. Thank God. Now, I suppose we've got to go and pick up young Raleigh. 
Charles, drive him back to the field position, please. I'll follow you up in five minutes. Charles! Any sign of him? No, sir. But I brought Sergeant Sharp along, as he may have a clue for us. Clue to what, Sergeant? Well, sir, you asked me to tell Mr. Swapper to carry on with the barrage when you went off to RHQ. Well, go on, then. But he asked me why you'd sent the message and what you and Mr. Holt was doing. Well, I told him what we talked about, and as soon as I'd finished, he scarped out of the command post. I followed him and saw him take a car without the driver. And that's the last I saw of him, sir. Thank you, Sharp. That'll be all. Sir? It's nearly a quarter past eight now, Bertie, so he's been gone the best part of three hours. Perhaps we'd better organize a search party and... Sir? Major Gray, sir. What is it, best? Sir, I've just intercepted a signal being passed from the infantry on the beach, sir. One of their patrols saw a truck being driven furiously over the cliff edge, sir, and they say it looked like an artillery vehicle. It sank straight into deep water. They've taken out a boat, sir, but there's no sign of the truck or the driver. Did they say when this happened, Best? Uh, the original message was timed 0800 hours, sir. Mm. Thank you, Best. And go and ask for more information. Right, sir. Uh, dead on time, Bertie. Perhaps it's just as well. I think I could have gone through all that again. You know, Bertie... I think he had a reason for killing himself, bang on the yard appointed for Brocky's execution. Perhaps he was trying to make an end. It's an interesting thought, Charles. <coughs> what is it, Sergeant? Well, I meant to ask before, sir. It's just that the lads have been wondering how Captain Benfield is, sir. Since he was taken away with that serious illness, we haven't had any news of him. Well, I think we can safely say he's turned the corner now, Sergeant. We're all confidently expecting he'll make a complete recovery quite soon. In The Appointed Hour, by Douglas Clark, Lieutenant Charles Holt was played by John Sampson. Second Lieutenant Rolly Swaffer, Sean Barrett, Major Bertie Gray, John Bentley, Captain Brocky Benfit, Michael McLean, Lieutenant Colonel Conway, Douglas Blackwell, Captain Bob Newman, Richard Hampton, Major Miller, Alexander John, Second Lieutenant Henry Kahn, Sean Arnold, President of the Court Martial, John Bryaning, the Defending Officer, Brian Haynes, the Prosecuting Officer, William Edel. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The play was produced by Roger Pine.